If you could, please open your Bibles to Matthew 25, the 25th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, we're going to be teaching out of the King James Version for this message, and we're going to be teaching verses 1 through 17. Again, Matthew 25, verses 1 through 17. This is known as the parable of the ten virgins, uh, one of Jesus' parables, the parable of the ten virgins. You know, folks, we've been hearing a lot on the news about this big royal wedding, uh, that Prince Harry is going to be marrying uh, Meghan Markle, um, and, and there's so much emphasis placed on the wedding and her dress and so forth. My friends, uh, what's interesting is we here in America, too, uh, place more emphasis on the wedding than we actually do the marriage. Marriage. Matter of fact, when I counsel some many people that I have officiated their weddings, um, which uh, is. I'm very cautious of, of officiating weddings. Many of them I will say no to. Uh, but when I have officiated weddings, I will caution them to uh, to not learn, uh, to, to, to actually learn from my mistakes um, and, and that they would spend more time in their marriage uh, than they would their actual wedding. Because a wedding is only going to last one hour. A marriage is supposed to last a lifetime. Uh, but I'm going to talk about a different wedding here because Jesus talked about a different wedding. But what I'm going to do that might be a little bit different than a lot of sermons you've heard on this parable through the years or decades is that I'm not going to be talking so much about Israel. I'm not going to be talking so much about uh, the, the wedding and the culture and, and how weddings were done then and why weddings were done that way then. What I'm going to be talking about more is what Jesus wants us to know more about, and that's him, the bridegroom, and his church, the bride of Christ. Uh, this sermon I pray God will use to edify uh, Christ's bride, that it would glorify the Father, exalt the bridegroom Christ, and edify the bride of Christ, and warn false converts, and then warn the church to be watchful and endure to the end. That's the reason for this parable. Recently, I was having a conversation with a longtime friend, uh, Michael A. Baker. Uh, we were discussing how so many professing Christians are seemingly trusting in or relying on their political parties and elected politicians over the sovereignty of God. Even many pastors across the heartland seem to be more worried or troubled about the health of America than the health and state of the Lord's church. And many of them demonstrated that in the last presidential election, even to the point of political idolatry. It seems that a majority of today's professing biblical worldviews are less and less biblical and more like the world. Today, more and more local churches, now remember, I am not bad-mouthing God's church. I am not bad-mouthing the Lord's true church. We're talking about churchianity, professing churches, professing Christians, and particular uh, in individual local churches across the heartland. Uh, but today, in more and more local uh, prof uh, prof uh, churches, uh, they're seemingly too worried about a loss of income uh, and pleasing their customers, their congregation, uh, more than they are the loss of their own souls or the loss of the souls out there in the world. The Barna Group, who's done some great studies over the years, another one came out, a more recent one. The Barna Group reported that 51% of churchgoers have never heard of the Great Commission. 25% said they've heard of it, but don't understand what it means. 6% said, I'm not sure. And 17% of them have heard of the Great Commission, and they do understand it. But I submit to you, this is where I want to zoom in, I submit to you that a majority of those 17% that do understand the Great Commission do not demonstrate it and apply the Great Commission. They do not demonstrate it. In other words, they don't do it. At least 95% of our local churches do not send out heralds to preach the glorious gospel in their own streets, their own Jerusalem. But rather instead, they are simply inviting others to their church. And when they do send out what they call missionaries, they send them out more to play on the playground uh, rather than engage in spiritual warfare on the battleground. Recently, I turned down an opportunity uh, to go to Israel this June in two months uh, with a team of heralds to proclaim the glorious gospel in the streets of Israel. Unlike a majority of the churches, the local churches within America, uh, this team does demonstrate the Great Commission. Uh, but sadly, approximately 95% of our local churches do not. 
As I stated in a blog post, and I quote, I cringe, and think about this, when, you send, when your church sends out missionaries, what are they doing? Is, God, is the gospel in Christ the forefront? As I stated in a blog post, I cringe at the thought of, of the millions and millions of dollars that local churches within America raise each year so that their sheep can go to Israel for nothing more than a learning experience, a paid vacation, and or a glorified field trip. To do so without primarily sharing the gospel is self-serving and gratuitous. But the Bible does command Christians to go out and preach or share, his glorious gospel, and to make disciples, even to be willing to, be, to lay down their lives for the cause of Christ, end of quote. Paul Washer of Heart Cry Missionary Society, one of my postmodern mentors at large, most of my mentors are at large are old dead men, but Paul Washer is one of my postmodern mentors of at large for, for missions work and evangelism. He said that he's been told by Christians in other countries uh, Peru and China, at least two of them, uh, that, that churches told them, quit sending us missionaries from your country, that they wish that America would quit sending them missionaries, uh, missionaries that do not put the gospel of Christ and Christ in the forefront, in the for front and center of their work. Uh, we're sending do-gooders out there to, 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 to go out and just spend more time establishing relationships and, and performing good works and good deeds and building huts and putting on tennis shoes and doing dentistry work. And, and, and Jesus, the gospel, is way down here. And the gospel is way down there. And my friends, that, that, is, that is dangerous. That, that is not loving Christ. That is not glorifying God, in my opinion. Too many local churches, Christians, and pastors and evangelists are creating false converts. As my friend Michael A. Baker said regarding America's Christendom, that we're seeing, and I quote, a spiritually drowsiness evident in the steep moral and cultural decline that even surpasses Saddam, Rome, Carthage, and Greece, that the visible evan evangelical church has overseen since Billy Graham's era of the 60s. If the millions that have professed Jesus as Lord and Savior over the decades in these and subsequent crusades had indeed been converted, the culture and caliber of our country would indeed be radically different, close quote. Michael is, is right on there, my friends. Uh, let's, and then Michael continues to go on to say this, quote, Yet the materialist, superficial, celebrity-driven, comfortable, entertainment-oriented, multi-billion-dollar evangelical industrial complex, seeker-friendly, and largely devoid of orthodoxy, sanctification, holiness, true fear and reverence of the one who spoke the cosmos into existence and humbled himself to die on the cross for us, for Christians, soothes the unrepented and careless in the midst of probably the biggest sovereignly directed transition in world history since the Great Flood, if not the decline and fall of Rome. Close quote. My friends, it is wrong to merely complain about a problem. A commanding officer told a group of LAPD officers many years ago, never complain about a problem unless you can bring a solution to the problem. My friends, Lord willing that I finish this sermon, I will bring the solution to this problem. And that is why I'm sharing this parable of the ten virgins. In this parable, the Lord Jesus gave statistics way before the Barna group, as you will see in the following parable that 50% of these professing Christians were false converts. 50% of these professing Christians, these foolish virgins, were false converts. After examining, studying, and experiencing the worsening churchianity within America for the many years, I submit to you that the false conversion rate is much worse now than just 50%. Sadly, the five unfaithful uh, lost virgins uh, represent a majority of people sitting inside church buildings today. So let us examine the scathing warning from the Lord Jesus. But let me take a little sip here first. All right, Matthew 25. The Lord Jesus said in Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. 
they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Verse 6. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there not be enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and that, that they were ready, went in with him to the marriage, and shut the door. And the door was shut. Verse 11. Afterward came also other virgins, the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son, wherein, wherein the son of Man cometh. Father, I pray, I thank you, Lord, for this message, Lord. Lord, I pray, Father God, that this message, as, as always, would, would honor you and glorify you, that, that Christ, the bridegroom, that Christ, the bridegroom, would be exalted, Lord. That we would point to Jesus, point to Christ, point to the bridegroom of this wedding and of the marriage supper of the Lamb. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you will help me and teach me as you are the helper and teacher. I pray, Lord, Holy Spirit, that you will help and teach others that are listening to this message, that are reading the Word of God along with me. I pray, Lord God, that you would sanctify us, that you would, holy, that you would grow us in holiness, that we would grow in your grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, beginning with verse 1, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus said, we're going to exegete verse by verse, Jesus said, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Jesus began by saying, Then shall the kingdom of heaven. He starts this way because he is continuing his former discourse, also known as the Olivet Discourse. These virgins represent the nominal church of Christ. Again, these virgins represent the nominal church of Christ waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus, waiting for the bridegroom. The ten virgins in this wedding party looked the same externally, but internally and eternally they were nothing alike, and more on that later. However, in this next verse, Jesus separates the sheep from the goats, he separates the truly saved from the saved, the saved from the false converts. In verse 2, next to verse 2, Jesus declared, And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. Jesus said that 50% of these virgins, five of them, were foolish, meaning they were false converts, false disciples. They were mere believers, uh, pseudo-followers, if you were. This word foolish comes from the Greek word moros, which means to be godless, to be impious, heedless, to be morally a blockhead, and might I add, to be morally bankrupt. It is the same foolish or morose referred to the unsaved man who built his hand on the sand rather than on a solid foundation in Matthew 7, 26. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said the following about these five false converts. And I quote, Let us feign hope that we are not to gather from our Lord's words that one half of the professing church is composed of those whom he calls foolish. Yet our Savior would not have spoken of so great a proportion if there were not really a great large admixture of foolish professors with the wise professors of the grace of God. End of quote. I could imagine what Spurgeon would say today regarding the state of the professing church within America. Uh, surely it is far, far worse. Uh, there are many false converts today that have an intellectual belief, uh, but their hearts are not regenerate. They have not experienced the saving doctrine of regeneration. Good old Matthew, Matthew Henry said this, and I quote, Sincere Christians are the wise virgins, and hypocrites the foolish ones. Those are the truly wise or foolish that are so in the affairs of their souls. Many have a lamp or profession in their hands, but have not in their hearts sound knowledge and settled resolution, which are needed to carry them through the services and trials of the present state. 
Their hearts are not stored with holy dispositions, but the new creating by the new creating Spirit of God. Our light must shine before men and good works, but this is not likely to be to be long done unless there is a fixed active principle in the heart of faith in Christ and love to God and our brethren, close quote. I do have a postmodern quote here for you. Uh, D.A. Carson said, The wise and foolish virgins are true and false disciples, and the exclusion of the, vir- the foolish virgins from the wedding feast represents the judgment of unbelievers on earth during the day of the Lord, while believers participate in the heavenly marriage supper of the Lamb. Close quote. Since 50% of these virgins were false converts, then could you imagine the percentage of false converts today due to America's postmodern, easy believism, the acceptance gospel, and unbiblical, uh, various unbiblical soteriologies? John Trapp, another old guy, said said that they were said this that they were but but of foolish virgins, that is of profligate professors that have no more than an outside. There are not a few, but more than a good many in all places. John Trapp believes then, hundreds of years ago, that these false converts are not only a few, but good, but a good many in all places. Now, moving on to verse 3. Jesus said in verse 3 that they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. They were pretenders with their lamps, but not practicers of Christianity. Uh, they were not faithful nor fruitful. Their lights were on, but nobody's was home. Who does that? Who leaves the coming of the bridegroom at such a time? Not a true believer, not a true convert. Spurgeon further commented that they made a profession of attachment to Christ, but that they but they have not the inward supply of the Spirit of grace to keep it up. Close quote. Verse four. But the wise took oil in their lamps. It took oil in their vessels with their lamps. In their vessels with their lamps. The wise five virgins or the saved virgins, were, were always ready for the bridegroom, Christ, because a conversion must, must accompany a professing convert. Conversion must accompany a professing convert. The converted wise virgins not only took their lamps, but they took extra oil along with their lamps. Imagine a police officer or, or a military soldier only taking a loaded firearm, but no extra rounds in their ammunition or excuse me, no extra rounds in their additional magazines. And one shooting I was in, unfortunately, I experienced hearing that click when it should have been a bang. That is an awful sound, my friends, to hear a click when you're hoping for a bang when you're in the middle of a shootout. I could not imagine thinking that I was saved, but learn at the last moments of my life that I had no oil in my lamp, that I had no true saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, because I was a false convert. From 1986 until November 14th, noontime, November 14th, 1991, I was a foolish virgin, but only by the grace, so go I. These five wise virgins representing salvation were prepared to meet Christ. They were preparing for his coming. But the five unwise virgins did not just run out of oil because they were unwise, but rather they had no oil to begin with because they were not saved in the first place. As the scripture says in 1 John 2.19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not of us. Check my battery there. Sometimes i got to remember i got to check my battery uh, before I do the study. Uh, in verse 5 it says, While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Nothing wrong with sleeping, my friends. There's a time we need rest. And the Lord's Scriptures talks about that. But Dr. R.C. Sproul Sr. said this, Those de- or, excuse me, These details belong to the parable's social shed- setting and narrative movement. They should not be allegorized. Even wise virgins sleep, and even foolish find oil to buy. Instead, the story makes a single point. When the bridegroom arrives, it will be too late to prepare to welcome him. Close quote. 
Jesus said the bridegroom, representing himself. Jesus speaks of the bridegroom. He's talking of himself, tarried. But why did the Lord Jesus tarry? John Trapp, another old school scholar hundreds of years ago, he laid out five biblical reasons why Jesus tarried. First, to exercise our patience. Second, to an eager our desires. And third, so that the elect may be all gathered. And fourth, that the mystery of iniquity may be fulfilled. And fifth, that the prophecies may be accomplished, etc. Close quote. While watching for the bridegroom, Christ and uh, the bridegroom, Christ and all ten, ver all ten versions slumbered and slept together. Our buildings within America that we wrongfully call church are mixed with true converts and false converts. They look alike, they congregate together, and they sleep and slumber together. They worship together, they sing together. Those many false converts have just enough oil in their lamps to look saved, but they're not. It's a greasy grace, not a saving grace. Today, many local churches are asleep. Many professing Christians are asleep. Spurgeon said this, In the case of even true believers, the delay in Christ's coming causes disappointment, weariness, and lethargy, and his church falls asleep when she ought to be watching for her Lord. As for the foolish, whether self-deceived or hypocrites, there, there being no true life of God in the soul. After a while, their apparent earnestness disappears, and Satan drugs them into a fatal slumber. Close quote. But oh my, here comes their wake-up call. Here comes the wake-up call. It says in verse 6, And in midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. At midnight o'clock, there was a cry made. This phrase, phrase, there was a cry, comes from the Greek word kroge. It was used six times in the scriptures, and it means an outcry of tumult or, or tumult, an outcry of tumult or grief with clamor or crying. The ten virgins heard their wake-up call. The bridegroom has arrived, and they were summoned to go meet him. This is why when I herald the gospel, as well as many other street preachers, that my messages are not just for the lost. They're never just for the lost. Though I am evangelizing the lost while trusting in the Lord for the results, I am also crying out to those saved to be ready for the second coming of Christ. I am also crying out to the foolish virgins out there, out there in the world that believe they're saved but that are not. I am like Noah, pleading everyone to get into the ark. I am like John, being the voice in the wilderness, calling all men everywhere to repentance. I'm like Paul, warning them to redeem their time wisely and to walk circumspectly, to contend for the faith, and to endure to the end. I cry out to them to be ready to meet him, the bridegroom, either upon their death or his return. Moving on to verse 7, it says, Then all those, wise, all those virgins, all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. All ten virgins awoke and rose from bed. You see, it was customary to be lamp ready, to be lamp ready so that they could meet the bridegroom as these weddings were in the nighttime, in the middle of the night, in the dark, and to participate in this nighttime procession. The lamps were important to eliminate the bridegroom, bringing the bride home. But this is not about a wedding, my friends. This is about Jesus Christ as the bridegroom coming for his church, the bride of Christ. To trim the lamps means to clean their wicks, to light them, and to adjust the flames. But five of the lamps were running out of oil, my friends. Consequently, five of them could not meet the bridegroom, nor participate in what they were hoping for and waiting for. Oh, what a surprise, what a disappointment. The five foolish false converts were unwise and unfaithful. It says in verse 8, And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, but our lamps are gone out. Their wicks became dry and flickered to death, just like their souls. And so will their souls without the Holy Spirit quickening and regenerating their hearts. The oil of the Holy Spirit is not regenerating their heart. It will be too late for oil, 
too late for salvation. There are many false converts today uh, that have gone, that have died and gone to hell, that thought that they had lamps, that thought they had lamp oil, but their hearts were not regenerate and their wicks were dry. As Spurgeon said, it was worse to have a lamp that has gone out than never to have a lamp at all. It would be better to never have been born first, to have been born at all, because there would be no soul to endure God's wrath in hellfire. Jesus warned in Matthew 26, 24, The Son of Man indeed goes, just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born at all. These five false converts were, were not atheists that went to hell, uh, but they were given false promises of hope. They were given a false sense of eternal security. Uh, that is why I will never tell a person, uh, years and years ago I used to, but no more, uh, I will never tell a person uh, that, that responded to the gospel call, that seemingly responded to the gospel call, uh, that he is saved based on a mere profession of faith, lest I commit theological malpractice. Perhaps it will be millions of foolish virgins that will perish in hell. Millions, perhaps. Because they were wrongfully told by Billy Graham or others alike that they were saved via unbiblical soteriologies. How many of them will have lamps but no oil? Spurgeon said this, Those who are putting off their repentance till their dying hour are like these foolish virgins. Those, their, their folly has reached its utmost, its utmost height. When the death sweat lies, lies cold on the brow, the neglected oil of grace will be valued. Then will come the despairing cry, Send for a minister to pray for me. Get in some Christian people to see what they can do for me. Close quote. Speaking of sending for a minister to pray for me, I remember in November, December, and January of last year and this year, a 92-year-old woman summoned for a minister to come in. She even used the language, I'm told, to give me my last rites. I went there. I was summoned to go visit her. I spent two to three days a week for several months, except for about eight days I had the flu. I couldn't go. And unfortunately, that's when she died. But she summoned for someone to help her in her last hours. I gave her the law. I warned her of God's wrath. I told her she was a sinner and she was going to die and go to hell in that hospice bed if she was not saved. She appreciated that I told her the truth in love. I gave her the gospel of grace and the gospel of salvation. And then I spent time laboring, in the, laboring through the Psalms and teaching her the word of God and reading her to the word of God. She professed with her lips, my friends. 92 years old, she died. I never told her that she was going to heaven because I do not know. I did not know her long enough. I did not know her long enough to test her fruits and examine her fruits. I do not know, my friends. I pray she's in heaven, but I could not give her that false sense of eternal security. Please understand this, my friends. There is no repentance without salvation, and there is no salvation without repentance. Repentance is not the cause of salvation, but repentance is because of salvation. Repentance is vertical, vertical as the Lord gives it to us, as he grants it to us as a gift, and then it manifests itself outward horizontally. Jesus tells us in the next verse how the wise virgins responded to the foolish virgins' request. Verse, verse 9. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. These five, five false converts asked the other five for some of their oil, but they were told no. The saving grace that the Lord gives to his elect is only enough for that one person. It is not enough to pass around. But what Christians can do while we're still alive is preach or share the glorious gospel to them and never comfort the lost in their sins, never make them feel comfortable on the way to hell. Never tolerate, acquiesce to their sins. The wise virgins told them to go by their own oil. The foolish virgins' lamps were dead. Their faith was dead. But the wise virgins had a saving faith that was made perfect in the end. Oh, what a terrible time to discover that their faith was dead. But the wise virgins had faith. <clears throat> Excuse me, I just got lost. <laughs> 
<laughs> hey, why don't I just admit I need to rely on my notes, okay? Oh, what a terrible time to discover that their lamps were empty and the other five faithful virgins could not help them. To go out and try to buy oil at this time of the night when the bridegroom would, would arrive was described by John Trapp as this, quote, as if God should say to the papists, go to your indulgers, pardon mongers, and kneelers, or to carnal gospelers, go to your parasitical preachers that have soothed you up in your sins, and ye love to have it so, or at the best have shot off a few pop guns only against gross sins, and licked you whole again presently with, I hope, better things of you, end of quote. These old guys, they didn't hold back, my friends. They didn't replace their salt with sugar in their shakers. Matter of fact, all of these quotes, I'm going to actually put all of these quotes, including my speaker's notes, below the YouTube video on my website, on the link on my website, so you can cut and paste any of this you want, my friends. Though I disagree with John Wesley on some doctrines, I value and appreciate his emphasis, his continued emphasis in holiness. Oh, my friends, we need this in all of our churches. As John Wesley said, But the wise answered, Lest there be not enough for us in you. Beginning the sentence with a beautiful abruptness, such as showed their surprise at the state of those poor wretches who had so long received them, as well as their own souls, lest there be not enough. It is sure there is not enough, for no, no man has more than holiness enough for himself. Go ye rather to them that sell, without money and without price, that is to God, to Christ, and buy if we can. Oh no, the time is past and returns no more. End of quote. Verse 10 is next. <clears throat> Verse 10, Jesus said, Jesus said, the Lord said, and while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Verse 10a says they went to buy. Let's break it down part by part, part by part, part, <laughs> part by part. Verse 10a says they went to buy. The lost five virgins ran out at the last minute to go buy more oil. They ran out and they went out to, 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 to get what they previously thought that they would never need, saving grace. But it was too late. Their lamps had just enough greasy grace to make them feel saved, but not enough saving grace. Verse 10b says that the bridegroom came. The bridegroom arrived. While they were getting more oil, they missed the big moment but it will be too late even after purchasing more oil. Verse 10c says, And they that were ready, they that were ready, went in with him to the marriage. The five wise virgins that were truly saved met the bridegroom and participated in this celebration. They were ready, they were faithful, they were fruitful, in season and out of season, all the way to the end. They finished well. But now we will see the eternal finality of, of all. Verse, verse 10d says, and the door was shut. My friends, the door was shut. If the many false converts inside these local churches died today, they would die without oil, they would die without salvation. Or if Christ returned for his bride today, they would be eternal lost. They would die anyways. When the door is shut, there are no more chances. There will be no excuses. There is no such thing as a purgatory. There is no more saving grace. This door in the Greek, thura, is described in my Greek library as, and I quote, the door of the kingdom of heaven, likened to a palace, denotes the conditions which must be complied with in order to be received in the kingdom, into the kingdom of God. My dear friends, the bridegroom is the door. Jesus is the door. Jesus is the door of life. Jesus said in John 10, 9 through 16, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out to find pasture. The thief does not 
come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that I may give life and that they may have it more abundantly. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, a hireling who, who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about his sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. The other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Thus saith the Lord Jesus. This word shut, my friends, is a scary word. This word shut, to shut the door, or the door was shut. This word shut in the Greek is the Greek word kleo, kleo. It is a verb which means, first, to shut up compassion, to shut up compassion so that it is like a thing inaccessible to one, to be devoid of pity towards one. Second, it means to obstruct the entrance into the kingdom of God. Folks, those are scary thoughts. Later, the foolish virgins or false converts return with their oil, but it goes from bad to worse. It'll be too late to repent, my friends. John Trapp said this, Opportunity is headlong and once lost, irrecoverable. It behooves us, therefore, to be abrupt, abrupt in the work of repentance, Daniel 4.27, as a work of greatest haste, lest we cry out, as he wants, all too late, all too late, or as the great lady of this land did lately upon her deathbed, time, time, a world of health, a world of wealth for an inch of time. We want not time so much as waste it. Remember that upon this moment depends eternity. God hath hanged the heaviest weights upon the weakest wires. Close quote. Jesus said now in verses 11 through 12, Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Those are the words that you don't want to hear at the end of life, our lives, my friend. I know you not. The virgins were never ready because they were never born again. They were, never, they were only mere believers, pseudo-Christians, professing Christians. Jesus also said these words to the many false converts, the many false converts in Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23, Jesus said this, for, de for two decades now I've called this the scare the, the scare the socks off of me verse. Not everyone who will say to me, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You who practice sin. You who practice iniquity. You who practice crimes against a holy God. It says in the first epistle of John, and he's talking to Christians that may be false converts, warning them that if we're practicing sin without repentance, if we're continuing in our wallowing sin, wallowing in our sins with no repentance, you cannot be truly born again of the incorruptible seed of Christ. Thus saith the Lord. Jesus said in Luke 13, 25, when once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you will begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you where you are from. Many professing Christians use that cliche, I know the Lord. I remember using the cliche, I found God, as if God was lost, but it was me that lost. Many will say, I know the Lord. But what matters in the end, my friends, is does the Lord know you? It says in 1 Corinthians 8, 3, But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Again, Jesus said in John 10, 14, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. 
these five foolish virgins did not truly bear his cross because Jesus said, pick up your cross. This does not save us. This work does not save us, but this work is an evidence and fruit of salvation where Jesus said, pick up my cross, deny yourself, and follow me daily. They did not pick up the cross, not biblically at least. A.W. Pink, another favorite, said this, quote, in Luke 14, 27, Christ declared, And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So cross-bearing is not optional. The Christian life is far more than subscribing to a system of truths or adopting a code of conduct or submitting to religious ordinances. End of quote. No doubt these five lost virgins were frantically pleading to Jesus to open the door. Open the door! No doubt their souls or hearts were trying to future their repentance. They were trying to put Christ's righteousness into their account. But it's too late. Christ did that on the cross for those that would repent and believe. It is too late. The Lord never granted these five foolish virgins repentance. As I promised in my preface that I would end with a solution to the problem. My friends, here is the solution to this problem, this growing problem across America, as my friend Michael A. Baker said. Jesus said in the last verse, verse 13, Watch, therefore, for ye neither, for ye know neither the day nor hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Watch, therefore. This word watch is the Greek word, Gregoryuho. It is a verb and it is a command. It is a verb and it is a command. It means to keep awake. To be vigilant. Yes, be vigilant, you Christian vigilantes. To wake up others. To be watchful. My Greek lexicon describes it as this. To give strict attention to. To be cautious and active. To take heed lest through remission and indulgence some destructive calamity suddenly overtake one. Close quote. That is why you'll find on my website a watchman tag. I tag particular posts, watchman, but unfortunately the truth is, is I probably tag too many things watchman when I shouldn't have. Uh, but it is a well-visited tag, the watchman tag. Jesus is commanding Christians to be actively watchful. Jesus here is commanding Christians in this verse as he completes this parable of the ten virgins to be actively watchful, to be vigilant, to be ready in and out of season, and then to endure to the end. You ask, what do I need to be watchful of? Well, I have to be honest with you. I've been a Christian a little while, and this is the first time I actually thought of laying down a bullet list of things to be watchful for. I pray, Lord, what are we to be watchful for? Well, the Scriptures are clear. There's some things in the Scriptures that we're to be watchful of. Many things in the Scriptures that we're to be watchful of that I'm not even going to mention in the sermon because of time. But I did put out a request to my Facebook friends asking them, hey, in the context of this verse... What's on your heart? What should we be watchful? So with a little help of my Facebook friends and their contribution to end this Bible study, here's a list of things that we need to be watchful for, including but not limited to. Be watchful of unrepented sin in the camp. Be watchful of false teachers, of false teachings, of false doctrines, of false prophets. Be watchful of sinful compromise. Be watchful of those who tempt us with sin. And yes, some of them are professing Christians. And remember, Satan's name is the tempter. Be watchful of those that try to violate your Christian conscience or your abiding convictions. Be watchful of professing Christians that will mock your growth in sanctification and holiness. Be watchful of wolves in sheep's clothing. Be watchful of our own sins, our own sins, my sins, and the need for continued repentance. Be watchful of heretics and those that would malicious, maliciously call you a heretic hunter. Be watchful of those that wrongfully call you a legalist, a holier than thou, or self-righteous, simply for obeying the gospel. Be watchful of the lukewarm church, the church of Laodicea, that I believe is in every local church. Be watchful of the dead church, the church of Sardis, again, I believe, is in every local church, at least most of them, I should say. Be watchful of the cold, loveless doctrinarians or the church of Ephesus. Be watchful of compromising sexually immoral churches or the church of Pergamos. Be watchful of the corrupt church, 
the church of Thyatira. Be watchful of pride and conceit. Be watchful of, of those things, of those people that are watchful. Be watchful of those that are watchful, but without prayer. Be watchful of unbiblical evangelism or evangelists. Be watchful for the return of Christ. Be watchful of the six things that the Lord hates in Proverbs 6, and there's much more that he hates than just those. Be watchful of religion, because religion has sent more people to hell than all the bars in this universe. Be watchful of baptismal regeneration. Be watchful of those who allowed Christian books to supersede the Holy Scriptures. Be watchful of those who have replaced their salt with sugar. Of those that of the, be watchful of sensuality, worldliness, and of being just like the world. And lastly, be watchful of those who slander you by wrongfully calling you a Pharisee. Thank God I've only been called a Pharisee by a handful of professing Christians. The last time happened last year, and I avoided that Christian forever. I'll, I'll leave it at that. But I remember one LAPD officer, a rookie right out of the academy. She was a beautiful woman, gorgeous. Everybody knew that she was a gorgeous woman, and she really stood out. She professed to be a Christian. Uh, my wife and I actually became friends with her husband and her. And one day, she was coarse gesturing a lot on duty as a police, police officer in Los Angeles, on duty, in uniform. She was coarse gesturing. And I lovingly corrected her, and I says, I'm surprised you're using those words, you know, being a Christian. That doesn't seem right. And she said, I'll never forget it, just this antagonistic response. Oh, you're a Pharisee. Oh, you're a Pharisee. My friends, I found out a month later that this girl was having an adulterous affair with another police officer. She destroyed her marriage. I met with her husband afterwards after finding this out. I turned, I turned this in. I reported this, this sin and this plagiarizing, or uh, excuse me, um, uh, uh, what do you call it when you're fraternizing with, with a probationary police officer, a rookie officer, the senior officer f filed a formal complaint against him. I even spent time with her husband trying to minister to him. She destroyed their marriage. One thing that I found out in most people that have wrongfully called me Pharisees, or me a Pharisee, or people that have wrongfully called other Christians that will be in a, simply trying to obey the gospel. One thing I found in common with, with almost all of them is we found out that they were very carnal, that they were wallowing, wallowing in unrepented sin. And so their only recourse is to call other Christians that are obeying the gospel a Pharisee. That is slander, to call a Christian a Pharisee. That is not a Pharisee. We have to be careful with our words, my friends. Be careful. Matthew Poole said this of being watchful. This watchfulness we had interpreted by an opposition to sin, both of admission and of commission, taking heed of having our hearts overcharged with sure-fitting and drunkenness and cares of this life, Luke 21, 34 through 36, taking heed of smiting our fellow servants, eating and drinking with the drunken, close quote. Lastly, not only do we need to be watchful in these last days, we must run from things that are contrary to the scriptures. And yes, there is a time to not only be watchful of these things or some of these people, but there is a time to actually run from professing Christians or local churches. I'm going to close with a video of an excerpt from a sermon by the name of, uh, the video is entitled, Run for Your Life, by Pastor Carter, Carter Conlon. Uh, he gave the sermon at Times Square Church in Manhattan, New York, immediately following the 9-11 attack. Imagine that, the Sunday following the 9-11. This is in New York, right next, right near downtown, and the pastor gave the sermon. And here is a sermon excerpt entitled, Run for Your Life. Yes, my friends, be watchful, and sometimes you'll need to run for your life. Thank you so much for watching this.